Tanya. Hi, Talia. Welcome back, everybody, to this week's exciting episode of Crimes and Consequences. I've got a really sad and very gruesome no. story to share with everybody. I'm letting you know up front. It's very high in the gruesome scale. Oh, no. And it's very high in the sad scale. Ugh. Before I tell the story, uh, I want to ask everybody to hit the subscribe slash follow button like we ask every week. That would be so helpful. And I want to let you guys know that I got most of the information from search warrants and affidavits and arrest warrants all filed with the court and police records. And then I also listened to a podcast called Unresolved. That being said, okay, I'm ready. Are you ready? I am ready. Okay, we've confirmed it. I'm going to go. <laughs> Bethany, Oklahoma is a small town located in the metropolitan area of Oklahoma City, right smack in the middle of America, basically. The morning of October 13th in 2011, animal rescue volunteers were setting up traps behind Homeland Grocery Store. They were trying to humanely trap some feral cats that had been reported in the area. They were near a tree line that demarcated the store's property from a small patch of woods. When both of them were overwhelmed by this nauseating odor, the origin of the smell appeared to be coming from two large black bags slightly obscured in the low-laying brush. You're out in a wooded area and you smell something foul. And it's coming from... Some bags? Yes. Oh, not good. Not good. The two volunteers knew whatever was in those bags needed to be investigated by the police, not them. Mm -hmm. So they called 911. In less than 10 minutes, officers arrived on the scene and immediately recognized the unequivocal smell of death. Flies were swarming the bags, and officers knew. Whatever was inside them was clearly dead. One of the arriving officers untied what was described as a black laundry bag with a white drawstring and opened it up. When he did, he found the partial remains of a decomposing and dismembered body. Ah, man. Everyone on the scene knew what was in the other bag. The rest of the person. Exactly. And the remains were taken to the Oklahoma City morgue for an autopsy. The Homeland Grocery Store, which is now known as Cash Saver, was a grocery store that was in a small shopping plaza. And there were a few other businesses that shared one large parking lot. There were multiple entrances to this parking lot. So there was a lot of activity. You wouldn't really expect someone to choose that location as a clandestine dumping ground for a body. Right. A lot of traffic. Exactly. A lot of foot traffic, too, I would think. It's a grocery store. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just literally behind the grocery store. The Bethany police force were used to the usual crimes that plague a small town. You get domestic violence, B&E, things like that. But this was clearly beyond their scope of expertise. I mean, this was a hardcore and brutal murder. Detectives combed the area for any clues that they thought might be relevant to the two bags there, but there was nothing else that they discovered in the area that seemed to have any connection to those bags. That area appeared to be a disposal site and not the actual location of the murder. Authorities had a strong indication about who the victim was in those bags. They were pretty sure it was 19-year-old Karina Saunders from the neighboring town of Mustang, who'd been reported missing by her mother, Margie Queen, only three days earlier. Karina was this intelligent young woman. She excelled at school. She even earned an accounting scholarship for college. In high school, she was a mathlete. She won the spelling bee three years in a row. But after she graduated in 2010, her life began to change. Karina started smoking weed, and eventually that high wasn't enough for her. 
similar to other parts of the United States, crystal meth plagued the Oklahoma City metro area. And as most people in America know, crystal meth is a huge problem in some areas of the country. And apparently, Oklahoma City is one of them. Karina developed a transient lifestyle, and she spent most of her time around nefarious individuals with criminal records who also did drugs. But in the summer of 2011, her parents, Margie Queen and Richard Saunders, they convinced her to go to rehab. And she did. By September, she'd achieved sobriety and completed the program. When she was done, she ended up moving in with her 22-year-old cousin named Catherine, who was more like a sister to her. And for a few weeks, Karina was back to her old self pre-drug Karina. On the third week of September, she spent the weekend with her family and friends. She went to a baby shower. She even attended church with her mom. So she seemed like she was on the right track. Like so many other kids in this new generation, social media was Karina's means of communicating. Thank God there was no social media when we were younger. Oh, Jesus. Don't, oh, don't even get me started on the shit I would have done. Thank you. Yes, I dodged a bullet (laughs) in college without social media. Karina specifically used Facebook and Facebook Messenger. She didn't have a cell phone and she didn't have a car. So when she was reported missing by Margie on October 10th, there really wasn't much for police to go on. It was Karina's mom, Margie. She's a postal carrier. She plastered missing person flyers all over the community, hoping that Karina or someone who knew Karina would reach out and let her family know she was alive and well. But now Margie had the police calling her with the news that they'd found this body and they wanted Karina's dental records. That didn't make any sense to Margie. She didn't understand why she couldn't just go down there and view the body to determine if that was her daughter or not. She made an off-cuff remark to authorities saying, quote, it isn't like She was dismembered. Oh, no. And those words would later come to haunt her. The next day, the medical examiner confirmed what authorities had suspected. 19-year-old Karina Saunders was indeed the victim of an unimaginably heinous and cruel death. According to the autopsy, the bag labeled bag number one, that was a black laundry bag I described with a white drawstring, inside it, It had another clear plastic bag. On that bag in red print were the words, quote, don't put over children's cribs or beds. We've seen that, right? Plastic bags. Inside that bag was Karina's decapitated head and the top part of her neck. Her once long, dark brown hair had been crudely hacked off, leaving less than three inches remaining on her scalp. Oh, my goodness. Like, what the fuck? Why do people do that? I don't know. Maybe as a way to conceal her identity? Well, one of our listeners commented when we posted recently about a mini that you did. Oh, on Teresa Venegas. Yes. And they said that they knew of a case where the hair got chopped off because there was DNA evidence in the hair. Oh. So maybe? Maybe. I mean, that's a possibility. A large, dark bruise covered her right eye area. She'd experienced some sort of blunt force trauma there. Probably, most likely, I'm guessing, a hard punch. She also had, quote unquote, suspicious bruising over her right cheek and right shoulder, which appeared to be the result of some sort of torture. And I don't know why that's the conclusion they reached, but that's what I saw in everything I read. There were over 20 various cuts of different lengths, depths, and directions on Karina's neck, and her trachea was transected, which is a fancy way of saying cut. Below the plastic bag that contained Karina's head were her lower right and left legs wrapped in eight feet of plastic wrap. 
like saran wrap. Are you kidding? No, me? I'm not kidding That's you. It's fucked up too. So I, I mean, I've just this started on weird. the fucked up level. This right. is so bad. This is so weird. Both legs had been disarticulated at the knees, and her feet had been removed at the ankles. Damn. They were missing. The bag labeled bag number two was a black Nike duffel bag. This bag was filled with maggots and insects. Inside it, there were more body parts wrapped in clear plastic wrap. Specifically, the Nike bag held her chest, abdomen, and upper thighs. And I believe it was one big body part. Duct tape was wrapped around both parts of her thighs twice and around her kneecap once. Noticeably absent were her forearms and hands. And there was an eight by eight inch wound on the left side of her chest where her left breast once was. Oh, man. It had been cut off and exposed her muscles below. An eight by eight is very, I mean, that's large. That's large. Above the missing breast was a one inch cut, perhaps made with the sole purpose of just inflicting pain. I'm not sure that's my take on it. Karina's corpse was naked and none of her personal artifacts were in those bags. There was a crude attempt at disarticulating her legs at the hips, like they tried to cut the top part of her legs off. However, after pretty much succeeding on the right side, they abandoned their efforts when they got to the left. Karina had a large tattoo in the upper middle part of her back between her shoulder blades. And the tattoo read Queen, but Queen is spelled K-W-E-E-N. And below it, it said Spade. Queen Spade. At first, I thought, well, her mother's last name is Queen. But her mother spells her last name like queen, king and queen. And this is K-W-E-E-N. In between the words queen and spade, there's this very unique design of a spade and it's large. A rectangular cut was made around the tattoo in an attempt to remove it. But again, eventually they abandoned their efforts. So that's why I'm wondering if her hair wasn't chopped off to maybe disguise who she is because they also tried to cut out a tattoo so people wouldn't know. Well, then they're dumbasses if that was the idea. They're horrible monsters. Toxicology reports found the prescription pain medicine tramadol in her system. However, her body was too decomposed to determine precisely when she'd been given it or how much she'd been given. I don't know all that much about tramadol. I know it's not a heroin derivative, but I know it's a prescription pain medicine. What's notably missing from the autopsy report is any mention of sexual assault. And that's most likely due to the fact that Karina's genitals were just extremely decomposed. Karina's cause of death was classified as quote unquote violent, and the manner was labeled homicide, obviously. It was impossible for the medical examiner to determine exactly how she died. However, her hyoid bone and her thyroid cartilage, they were intact, leading to the conclusion she wasn't strangled. None of her bones were broken. I mean, some were sawed, but they weren't broken. And there was no evidence of internal or abdominal bruising. So basically, she wasn't beaten to death. Most likely... And this is just armchair detective talk. I'm assuming most likely she bled out Uh, because she had a bunch of wounds on her neck besides the final one that decapitated her. Whether she bled out as a result of dismemberment, again, I don't know. I'm just speculating. I have no idea. It was impossible for the medical examiner to determine all that. I think people need to understand what was in this bag was somewhat liquefied. I mean, there was a lot of decomposition involved. Her feet, her forearms, and her hands, along with her left breast, have never been found, as have none of her personal belongings either. There was some bruising on her shins, which may be ligature marks, but it couldn't be really determined. 
Based on the autopsy, Karina had been killed three to four days prior to the discovery of her body, putting her death at around October 9th or October 10th. Her mom had reported her missing three days prior to those remains being found. However, she hadn't been seen or heard from by her family and friends since September 28th, and that's two weeks earlier. As what often happens with addicts, that urge to use, coupled with the influence of people who are only out to use her, drew Karina back into her old lifestyle. And it's just so sad because she had so much potential. So let me tell you a little bit about the last few weeks of Karina's life. On Wednesday, September 28th, Karina made what would end up being her final Facebook post. She wrote, quote, what's everybody doing tonight? And the person that responded was no one she should be spending any time with. 44-year-old Kenny Richards sold math. I'm sorry, Tanya just gave me this look. 44 and she's 19. I know, he's gross. Mm Mm-hmm. His name was Kenny Richards. He sold meth and he had a history of convictions for possession and distribution of drugs. He's just a fucking loser, okay? I'm saying it. He can sue me. I don't care. (laughs) Prove me wrong. Previously, Karina had mentioned to several people that Kenny had made a nude video of her for the internet. and. Maybe he could help her get into porn. Really? And that he wanted to, quote, pimp her out. I knew he was a scumbag. I know. Although Karina considered Kenny her friend, in reality, he was supplying her drugs and at the minimum, grooming her for the sex trade. Definitely. And that's my take on it. He's not just wanting a new best friend. That's 19-year-old pretty girl named Karina. Mm, Come on. And helping her out of the goodness of his heart. Yeah, right. That evening, Karina asked her cousin, Catherine, whom I told you she lived with, for a ride to Taco Bell, where Kenny was waiting to pick her up. Catherine watched as Karina, carrying a small bag that contained all of her earthly possessions in it, hopped into Kenny's 1995 gray blazer and drove off. That was the last time Catherine ever saw her cousin alive. Karina's family wasn't really too alarmed by the fact they hadn't heard from her in over a week because of this transient lifestyle that she'd been living for the past year. But on October 9th, Catherine received an alarming text from a man named Matthew Kyle Savage. And it was that text that caused her to be concerned for Karina's safety. Matthew Kyle Savage went by Kyle. Kyle had known Karina for a little over a year, and she'd been warned by others that he was trouble and that she should delete him as a Facebook friend. He was really rough around the edges, and he had a history of drinking and doing drugs. Kyle and Karina communicated frequently via Facebook, and when Karina was staying with Catherine, she also would text Kyle from Catherine's phone. In the weeks leading up to Karina's disappearance, Kyle and Karina went back and forth 10 times messaging on Facebook. The last one being from Kyle, in which he said, quote, call me or Brad, we'll be kicking it. Now, if you remember the last message from Karina was, what's everybody doing? Right. So I'm assuming that this message from Kyle, even though it was two days after Karina sent the message, I'm assuming it's in response to that. Regardless. After that, their communication stopped. But on October 9th, Kyle texted Catherine's phone in regards to Karina. Because remember, Karina had been using Catherine's phone a couple weeks earlier to talk to him. And in one of the texts, he wrote, quote, I will bury you next to Karina. Oh, damn. Yeah, because Karina's family didn't even know she was missing. And this is before her body was found. Catherine was so disturbed by this text that she called her Aunt Margie. Working together, the two women realized that Karina hadn't posted anything on social media in two weeks, and none of her family and none of her friends had heard from her since September 28th. And that's when Margie reported Karina missing. 
it was only after Karina's body was discovered that the police interviewed Kyle regarding this I will bury you next to Karina text. He was interrogated for hours. And the gist of what I got out of the reports is that he and Catherine had exchanged texts with him believing that Catherine was actually a male boyfriend or a romantic interest of Karina. He didn't know who he was texting. He didn't know it was her cousin? mm -mm, Because she just used The the phone to communicate with him. And he felt that the exchange between the two was threatening. Because again, he's thinking it's a man. Mm -hmm. And he was jealous and he was angry because he had a little bit of a love interest in Karina. Kyle says that text message was just poor judgment and really bad timing. (laughs) That's what he chalked it up to. After speaking with Kyle, police were very interested in speaking with Kenny Richards. Creepy Kenny. Thank you. That's mm-hmm. that's totally what we're going to call him. <laughs> Creepy Kenny. Since Karina was last seen getting into his vehicle, he was interviewed the same day as her body was found. And he admitted to picking up Karina at the Taco Bell. But according to Kenny, the two hung out for a while. And then he dropped her off later that night at Studio 41 Apartments, a few miles north. Karina's remains were found at the exact midpoint between those apartments and Taco Bell. There's no information regarding who Karina was with or what she was doing from September 28th until October 6th. However, a former Mustang High classmate had two random run-ins with her on October 6th and October 7th, and these run-ins only added to the mystery of Karina's murder. But before I tell you more, we're going to take a quick break. It was October 6th when a former classmate of Karina's named Keegan bumped into her at the Studio 41 apartment complex in Oklahoma City. And it's just so strange what he describes happening. She was sweeping some loose gravel off the bottom of an outside staircase that had just recently been repaired. Keegan said that when he spotted her, She, quote, walked up to me and gave me the biggest hug. We chatted for some time, and she explained to me that she was assisting my apartment handyman with some repairs as she was living with him and his son, end quote. The cheerful greeting took a really dark turn when Karina embarrassingly admitted that she hadn't eaten for days. Oh, man. I know. Weird. Right. Imagine for Keegan, lest he knew she was winning spelling bees and getting scholarships for accounting, and now she hasn't eaten in days. He brought her back to his apartment, and he made her two Hot Pockets. Aw. Hot Pockets. (laughs) Fucking delicious. (laughs) He bumped into her again the next day, and she was carrying this flimsy laundry bag with her. During conversation, she sheepishly mentioned to Keegan that all of her worldly possessions fit into one bag. He felt really sorry for her because it was basically a rag of a bag. And he ended up giving her this large green duffel bag to put her stuff in. She tried to make light of the dire situation and was extremely grateful to him for that small, kind gesture. He never saw her at the apartment complex after that day. And neither Karina's laundry bag nor Keegan's duffel bag, neither one of them were the bags that Karina's remains were found in, just so you know. Police caught a break in the case when they reviewed some CCTV footage from Newcastle Casino and Gaming Center. That's uh, some casino in Newcastle, Oklahoma, not far from Oklahoma City. It showed that Karina had been to the casino on October 8th, five days prior to her body being discovered. Video footage shows Karina getting into a red dual cab four-door Ford pickup truck. It's one of those massive trucks. And there were several men inside that truck. One man, he was described as having tattoo sleeves on both arms. He briefly stepped out of the truck for a second, so he was caught on the video, but it's very grainy. 
Then Karina climbed inside the pickup truck and it drove away. A second dark car was parked right nearby the red truck before it drove away. And there were at least two women inside that vehicle who were gesturing to Karina not to get into that truck. Oh no. That's the last time there's any record of Karina being alive. Her body was found about 20 miles away from that casino. Police had the daunting task of interviewing the underbelly of Oklahoma City society. Over 80 witnesses were questioned in the following months. Many drug addicts, drug dealers, thieves, sex workers. As more and more people began talking to authorities, a really horrifying scenario emerged from their statements and rumors. Karina had been murdered by a human trafficking ring. Her torture, dismemberment, and decapitation was captured on a video. What? And shown to other women as a warning that they had better cooperate or risk the same fate. Wow, that is fucked up. It's so, so fucked up. Her death was a demonstration of what would happen to anyone else that didn't follow the ring's orders and instructions. And when I say video, Tanya, I don't mean something shot with someone's cell phone. I am talking about high-quality lighting and a tripod camera being set up in a room. Seriously? Seriously. Dead fucking serious. What the fuck? This was premeditated and done with a purpose. The first eyewitness to come forward to police was a 20-year-old named Michelle Henshaw. Michelle was a troubled young woman with a history of drugs and prostitution. She told authorities that on October 11th, a man known to her as Big Country kidnapped Karina and her and drove them to a vacant house on 3500 South Harvey Street. That is a house known for drugs. This dilapidated two-story home even had the word dope spray painted on it. (laughs) I mean, hello, that's clearly a drug house. (laughs) People were always coming and going from it at all hours, and neighbors would constantly call the police about this house. According to Michelle, while she was at the house with Karina, Karina was beaten up in front of a group of people by a man named Louis Ruiz. She was then dragged upstairs to a bedroom. There she was tied with twine and rope to a small table. As others stood by and watched, Lewis grabbed a saw and he cut off Karina's foot while she was both alive and conscious. <sighs> Karina screamed in agony as Lewis began sawing off her left foot, but he stopped after the saw broke. Oh my God. Again, Karina's torture and murder was meant to serve as a warning to the other women that were part of this sex trafficking ring. Michelle, fearing she was next and getting the point of what they were trying to show her, jumped out a second story window and escaped the house. The injuries described by Michelle matched Karina's autopsy report, which hadn't been made public at the time. Unfortunately, that vacant house at 3500 Harvey Street had recently been demolished. Oh, geez. In a strange twist of fate, On the exact same day Karina's remains were found, the city tore down that eyesore due to all the complaints. The exact same day. That's crazy. That's weird. Weird coincidence. Mm -hmm. That was a huge blow to the investigation. I mean, they don't have a crime scene to examine. Coincidentally, 33-year-old Jimmy Massey, who went by the nickname Big Country. Did you know that's a very common nickname in that area? Stop it. It is. Big country. Big country. I'm sorry, I don't mean to make fun of it, but it's kind of stupid. <laughs> you just completely made fun of it. I know. <gasps> he was currently in an Oklahoma City jail. He'd been arrested as part of a task force investigation into a group of individuals who were moving large amounts of methamphetamine in and out of the area. When police interviewed Big Country, he admitted to being present when Karina was tortured and murdered. Later, a jailhouse snitch came forward stating that Jimmy slash Big Country described to him how he cut off the arms and legs of Karina. 
Jailhouse snitches. Don't even get me started on that shit. (laughs) I don't believe shit from them. Anyway, a second jailhouse snitch presented detectives with some notes written by Big Country that were passed back and forth between them, in which he not only described the dismemberment of Krina, but the details of how her body parts were wrapped in plastic. Since Jimmy was in prison facing serious drug trafficking charges, police weren't in a real big hurry to arrest him for murder, and they really wanted to take their time to build a stronger case against him. They believed he was one of at least four men involved in the planning and plotting of Karina's death. They next turned their focus towards a man named Louis Ruiz, who I told you Michelle had named as the man with a saw. He was a 36-year-old former elementary school teacher. It's true. And he's an associate of Jimmy's, and he somehow just got wrapped up into drugs and ended up at the seedy side of Oklahoma City. Investigators interviewed Stephanie Howard, Lewis's girlfriend at the time of Karina's murder. Stephanie seemed to affirm somewhat Michelle's account of the murder. According to Stephanie, on two occasions, she had joined Lewis at the 3500 South Harvey Street house, where together they babysat a teen girl whom was being held captive. On the second occasion of their babysitting, for lack of a better term, Lewis told Stephanie that the teen, whom she later identified as Karina, would soon be dealt with. Later, when Karina's murder made the news, Lewis confessed to Stephanie that it was he that had orchestrated and planned the entire torture and videotaping of her death. That's so fucking sick. It was really hard to do this case. I actually started working on it like six months ago and I had to stop. But it's the 10th anniversary of her murder, so I really wanted to get this story out. Next, police interviewed a guy named David Malone. He was a mutual friend of Big Country and Lewis, and he also trafficked meth. He came forward with information regarding Lewis's involvement in the murder. He said one day, while they were riding alone in a car together, Lewis confessed to him that he was responsible for the torture and the murder of Karina. So we have quite a few people pointing the finger at Lewis. But it wasn't until June of 2012 that police got the break they needed and arrested both Big Country, a.k.a. Jimmy Massey, and Louis Ruiz for first-degree murder. A young woman named Tia Denauer claimed to have actually seen the video of Karina's murder with her own eyes. A few weeks earlier, she was sharing a room at the Bel Air Hotel with Louis, and when he went to use a bathroom, she snooped through his phone. On it, she saw what she described as a video depicting Lewis cutting off Karina's foot. She stopped watching the video after hearing Karina just screaming and screaming. Tia knew Karina. The two ran in the same circles, and she'd even cared for Karina before when Karina was extremely high. Police considered Big Country and Lewis Ruiz two major kingpins of multiple drug and human trafficking rings, and they felt confident they were major players in the making of the snuff video. So here we go. Case closed, right? Well, sure. Yeah, of course not. Of course not. Some of the tactics used by the police with these witnesses Uh came under fire. Oh, shit. Many of them were already facing time for charges. I mean, we're talking about drug addicts, drug users who may have had a motivation to cooperate with police. There was no real evidence besides these various accounts from these different witnesses and the jailhouse snitches that tied Big Country and Lewis to the murder. I mean, there really wasn't anything solid. Police continued to work really hard to build their case against Big Country and Lewis, but instead of getting stronger, it fell apart. Tia, she changed her story. She admitted to police she never saw the video. But, Girl. But she knew someone who saw who it? saw the video <laughs> and told her about it. A friend of a friend of yes, a friend. <laughs> that's exactly what she said. And the witnesses' statements kept changing, and they didn't really match up. Yeah, the gist is that Karina was tortured and murdered in that Harvey house, but the details don't really match up. I mean, you have one person that says she was kidnapped with Karina and watched her be murdered. You have another person that says, I came to the house multiple times and babysat her before. Right. 
So it doesn't really match up. By February of 2013, the case against Big Country and Lewis completely fell apart and the charges were dropped. Lewis went on to file a civil rights violation oh, Jesus. against the city of Bethany, stating, quote, Bethany police detectives manipulated known drug addicts, falsified law enforcement reports, and coerced a confession. They ended up settling with him for $50,000. Jimmy Massey, big country, he served his time for the drug trafficking offenses that he was in jail for, and he got released. He ended up getting married and moving to Texas, and he has a young daughter. As a former Marine, he now teaches self-defense to women, and he's really on this campaign to clear his name. He even met with Karina's parents and they did an interview, which I have a link for in our show notes. He submitted to a lie detector test and he passed with flying colors. He never even met Karina before. So who did this? Who did this, Talia? Well, I can tell you the Bethany police and the Oklahoma City police were taken off this case (laughs) after 2013. And the Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigations took over. They issued a $10,000 reward for anyone who could provide the video evidence of Karina's murder. They had interviewed enough people to believe that the rumors about the snuff film were true. There was just way too much smoke for there not to be a fire. However, instead of focusing on Lewis and Big Country, they changed the direction of the case. In 2016, they issued a search warrant for the Facebook account of a 40-year-old woman named Judy Roberts. Judy's quite a character. Since 2002, she's been arrested 58 times. Oh my goodness. (laughs) For drugs, credit card fraud, check fraud, theft, identity theft, auto theft, you name it, Judy's fucking done it. She's a very bad criminal. She's she's been arrested that many times. She was one of the last people to see Karina alive. She had given police an interview only three weeks after Karina's body was found, but they didn't really take it seriously at the time. However, in 2016, they started taking it more seriously, and again, they issued a search warrant for her Facebook. During the interview with police in 2011, Judy explained that she met Karina at the Newcastle Casino only two weeks prior to Karina's murder, and the two became inseparable. Judy admitted that she trafficked and distributed meth for the Oklahoma Mexican drug cartel. Damn. I know. Girl, man, hell to the no. That's some scary, scary shit. I'm sweating just saying those (laughs) words. Oh, no, no, no. On the night of October 7th, Judy said that she and Karina spent the entire night at a casino doing drugs, and they continued these activities until well into the morning. Now, Tanya. Have you been to a casino? Yes. Did you know at casinos, there's a lot of sex workers there? I had no idea until you just said this. I didn't know it until someone, when I was at a casino, asked me if I was one. (laughs) (laughs) And I was like, excuse me? And he's like, you don't know, they're everywhere. And I looked around the bar and he's like, there's one and she's one. And I was like, what? How do you know this? I didn't know. I, mean, I guess because it was three in the morning and they were all dialed up and I was too, but I was like, no, dude, I'm just getting drunk. I am naive about certain shit. Because you have to ask yourself, what is Karina doing all night at a casino? Gambling? No. No. After staying at the casino all night, eventually they left it and they went to a man's apartment. He was known to Judy only as James Kyle. Karina and Judy had been crashing on and off at James's apartment for the past week or two. About 45 minutes after they arrived to James's place, Judy said she noticed Karina was extremely high and feared James had drugged her with some sort of hallucinogen. She decided it was time to go, and she called a man to come get them. Five minutes later, a Mexican man in an SUV picked them up and drove them to a house where Judy's teen daughter, Latosha, lived in Newcastle. Judy claimed she then left Karina at Latosha's home and went back to James's apartment for whatever reason. I don't, she didn't really give a reason. While she was at James's apartment, she spoke with someone from the Mexican drug cartel, and they demanded she traffic meth from Oklahoma to California, but Judy refused. She claimed she then fell asleep on James's couch. Fuck you, cartel. Nope, I'm busy. I can't do that. (laughs) 
Okay, sure, right. When she woke up, she called her daughter to check on Karina. Because remember, she left her there and Karina seemed extremely high or even hallucinating. Latasha told her that she dropped Karina off at the Newcastle Casino and she watched as Karina got into this big red truck filled with men. Judy told authorities that she believed Karina's death may have been a case of a mistaken identity. She thinks the Mexican drug cartel thought Karina was her daughter and that they kidnapped, tortured, and dismembered her to teach Judy a lesson to follow their orders. Judy's story was corroborated in part by her daughter, Latosha, but the two differ on one major point. Latosha said she did drop Karina off at the casino, but she said she dropped her mom off with her and that her mom, quote, ran right into the casino, end quote, while Karina climbed inside a red Ford pickup truck and went off with multiple male subjects. Hmm. So Judy acted like she wasn't there. Right. Police were able to track down this James Kyle guy. He was 36 years old. His name was James Kyle Donaldson. And he's a match made in heaven for Judy. He had 19 arrests for drugs, theft, and even assault with a sawed-off shotgun. Oh, real charmer. He spoke with police and corroborated much of what Latosha and Judy said. But his version also differed slightly from Judy's. James said he met Karina about two weeks before her death when she just randomly showed up at his house with Judy. He recalled how one time Karina was there and she was talking to him and she told James that she had stolen several ounces of meth from a drug dealer, the same drug dealer that Judy trafficked for. And Karina was really worried for her safety. Just as Judy had described, on the morning of October 8th, Judy and Karina showed up at his apartment, but James says he noticed Karina seemed extremely messed up and asked Judy, what did you give her? Because she was hallucinating. Judy told him not to worry about it. While they were all sitting around together, Karina and James overheard Judy talking on the phone with a drug dealer, and they both heard clearly How James knows that Karina heard, I don't know. But he says they both heard clearly that this drug dealer told Judy he wanted to talk to her about the money she stole from him. Uh Uh-oh. A few minutes later, an SUV with a male Mexican driver showed up, and that's the last time James saw Karina alive. James said a day or two later, Judy called him up, and she was crying. She was screaming. He couldn't even understand what she was trying to say. Then, the day after that, Judy showed up at his house with Latosha, and she appeared to be in shock. She had trouble breathing. She said that she owed drug traffickers money and that they had threatened to kill Latosha in retaliation. And James claims that he arranged for Latosha to get out of state and to go stay with her father. It was only two days after that that Karina's body was found. Huh. Strange, right? Mm-hmm. That's, that's strange. I don't know what became of the 2016 search warrant for Judy's Facebook account info, but I can tell you she's currently in the Oklahoma prison. Oh. Serving time for something. In 2016, police also issued a warrant for creepy Kenny Richards Facebook information. For some reason, the Bethany and Oklahoma City police never viewed him as a viable suspect. But he was very high on the OSBI's radar, and for good reason. Wait till I tell you about this. You're going to be like, what the fuck? Why wasn't he suspect number one? In March of 2012, just five months after Karina's murder, Kenny called the police to report finding a woman laying dead in a pool of blood on his living room floor. Really? A 22-year-old female whom they didn't reveal her name, at least in the articles I saw. She was an exotic dancer. She worked at the strip club in Oklahoma City called Night Trips. She was dead on Kenny's floor. And he had no idea how she got there? I guess not. It was originally believed that she overdosed, but later determined that the woman's body showed signs of trauma before her death, leading investigators to believe she was murdered. Okay, so now you got this guy... (laughs) 
who knows, two young women that have been murdered. Coincidence? I don't think so. I think not. Oddly, police really didn't investigate this anonymous tip that came in with Crime Stoppers in 2013. Someone had called to say they overheard a conversation between Kenny and another man in the parking lot of a convenience store. And during that conversation, Kenny said he drove Karina to the location where she was murdered, and then he later buried her clothing and other items. Then a week after that, Crime Stoppers got another anonymous tip. This person said that Karina's clothing and other personal items could be found in a metal tank in Kenny's backyard. A police officer walked around Kenny's backyard, but that's all he really? did. That's it? That's it. That's all they did in 2013. But in 2017, they got a warrant and they dug up the yard where Kenny lived at the time of Karina's murder. In the warrant, it said they were looking for shoes, socks, bra, underwear, belt, t-shirt, handbag, wallet, or missing body parts of hers. They didn't find anything in the backyard, but in the front yard, in a septic tank, they did. Ooh. They found a knife, a woman's sweater, a woman's sandals, and a jacket during their search. Why is that in a septic tank? Exactly. In Kenny's old yard. Kenny is in prison right now for drugs. He's not scheduled to be released for a while. Police haven't said anything more about these items found. However, they have declared him a person of interest in the murder of Karina Saunders. As I said, it's the 10-year anniversary of Karina's murder. I watched some interviews with the police, and they pretty much believe that Karina was killed. There was a videotape made, and that murder was to warn others other women that were in this ring to cooperate or face the same fate. So that appears to be the reason. Kenny says he's completely innocent of everything and quote, Saunders was a friend of mine. I miss her too, exclamation, exclamation. Okay. If anybody has any information out there on what happened to Karina Saunders, you can call the OSBI tip line at 800-522-8017. And that is all I know about the horrible murder of Karina Saunders. So it's still unsolved. It's still unsolved. That's so sad. Bummed out. It's such a horrible way to go. I am shocked at the reason why she was killed. If that is the reason, which if the police think it is, then I'm going to go with it. Yeah. And then it's fucking videotaped so other people can watch it. What do you, if somebody steps out of line, you have Pop the tape in the VCR and... Jesus Christ, hello, how old are you? You pop the tape in the VCR. (laughs) Nobody has a VCR anymore. (laughs) Put your VHS tape in. I mean, you play it on your phone for whoever and it's so stupid and it's so disgusting and sad. I just really feel for her family. What a heartbreak. Poor Karina. Nobody deserves that. Nobody. That's some hardcore shit. If you saw a video like that, you'd do whatever the hell they said to do, too. Oh, yeah. I'm pretty sure it would scare the shit out of me. Anyway, I want to thank you guys all for listening. It was a story that I really wanted to share with everybody. I wish I had more answers. I had a list of questions about it. Like, who was the maintenance man at the apartment complex? Yeah, that she was supposed to be staying with. If they saw footage of her going into a red truck, did they have footage of her previous times with Judy? Right. Who was seen dropping her off? Was it Latosha? And what's Kenny have to do with that? I don't know. I don't have the answers. But I encourage anybody that does to call the OSBI tip line. If you guys haven't done so already, please hit the follow slash subscribe button on your favorite app. I encourage you to check out our Patreon membership. We have over 100 exclusive episodes that you guys can access by joining. Go to patreon.com slash TNT crimes. You can also subscribe to our Apple podcast channel on your Apple Podcast app. It's got the same stuff as Patreon. If you want to find out more, go to our website, crimesandconsequences.com. And you can check out our social media by going to at Hardcore True Crime. That's our handle. Anything else? We have merch. We have merchandise. Check it out. It's on our website. That's it. All right. All right. Thank you guys for listening. And we look forward to you joining us next week. Sounds good. Don't kill each other. Bye. Bye.